Well, after years of waiting, Main Nabis is finally back! Anime only fans have been patiently waiting, and us manga readers have been anticipating this season like crazy. And from the first episode, I'm sure we can all agree that this is going to be a fucking incredible season. Hello everybody, my name is The Nickel Pickle, and for those who don't know me, I'm an avid fan of Main Abyss and have been animating this current arc in its manga form for over three years. This news series aims to talk about each episode per week and how it fares in comparison to the original manga. Fret not though, there will be no spoilers in this video, and if something I believe may tread that line, I'll be sure to give timestamps so viewers can skip potential spoilers. But enough dilly dally, because there is so much to talk about already. Welcome to my review of Main Abyss Season 2 Episode 1, The Compass Pointed to the Darkness. So immediately there are huge storytelling differences compared to the manga. Fun fact, the source material does not introduce any of these characters for like another 9 chapters. The Dawn of the Deep Soul movie ends at chapter 39 of the manga, whilst the Ganja Corp's backstory doesn't begin until chapter 48. The parallel editing, which by the way is my favourite part of this episode, was non-existent in the manga. The Ganja backstory was actually a mini arc that halted the trio's journey for a few chapters. It was technically an info dump, but a more engaging one at that. I think the use of parallel storytelling actually allows for better pacing and character development, which gives me more hope that this series will truly adapt the Golden City arc in the best way possible. There was actually a few cuts in this episode in terms of its dialogue, and actually this episode features the entirety of chapter 48 regarding the Ganja Corp's backstory, and only half of chapter 39 in regards to the main characters. Also, in this anime adaptation, it appears Vega was recalling these events to someone named Uramui. Now, us manga readers know this character, but I actually can't recall an interaction like this in the manga, except one at a particular point, which is various chapters away. Also, manga readers, no spoilers in the comments for the anime-only people, alright? A small detail that was different was actually how Bellafu handles himself in the anime compared to the manga. It's a minuscule detail that I happen to notice, but Bellafu in the manga is actually very similar to Vaiko in that he's actually quite seasick. It's a small detail, which doesn't do much, it's supposed to be kind of funny, where you can see that he's clearly vomited, but still trying to keep his composure and act cool in front of her. Also, I must say, the anime does a fantastic job already at portraying the beautiful friendship these two have. I love the character chemistry so much. Another change involves our main group, and my god, it's so good to see them again! They actually acknowledge that in the manga, they're actually going on their last dive. Which, in case you forgot, refers to when a delver goes past the fifth layer, making their journey one with absolutely zero chance of returning from. As Trina was said in the fifth layer is damn near impossible. Instead, certain lines actually just cut out to make the descent quicker. It's a tiny change, but an interesting one, I thought. But to be honest, in terms of manga deviation, that's about it. Mostly small details in terms of what was cut out, but in terms of how the story is told, there are huge deviations. As a manga reader, I gotta say, I kinda like this change. It actually reminds me a lot of how the very first episode of Maiden Abyss is actually really different to the first chapter in the manga. And I'm happy to say I welcome the change, and I'm actually quite curious to see how it'll affect certain moments in the series. Now, let's get on to the anime episode itself. Let's go through a very quick synopsis of the episode and the events prior to this. After Prushka was turned into a life reverberating stone, she became Riko's White Whistle. The instrument of the White Whistle is known to serve various functions. It is said to bring out the true nature of relics, which it does almost immediately after Riko uses it inside of the diving terminal, allowing them to progress further into the abyss. One poop and a pile of corpses later, the quartet finally arrive at the sixth layer, known as the capital of the unreturned. Whilst at the same time, the story of a group known as Ganja venture out to find something referred to as the Golden City. Clearly this was at an earlier point in the timeline, as Orth doesn't exist, and those who have settled in the pit have their own sacred language, which would soon be known as Netherglyphs. The Ganja Corp's main trio comprised of a charismatic leader known as Wasikin, who people follow due to the many prophecies that he predicts that come into being. Another is Belafu, who is second in command. He is analytical, sharp, and very philosophical. He's a quick learner who studies the human psyche and language as a whole. And finally, a girl named Vaiko. She happens to have the star compass that Riko supposedly owned back in Season 1. The rules of the compass are simple, it always points to the bottom of the netherworld. So following that compass, they arrive at the abyss and venture down to find the golden city they've been searching for. They are then accompanied by a girl who was branded by her tribe as a sacrifice to the abyss because she is unable to bear children. 
She acts as her guide, with Bellafu translating for her, and Vako acting as her guardian. They learn very briefly about the Curse of the Abyss, and a montage later shows that they venture all the way to the sixth layer. The episode then ends with both Ganja and the main trio arriving at the Cap of the Unreturned, but at different points in the main Abyss timeline. This was, excuse my French, fucking incredible. Sex doesn't mean shit compared to this adaptation. Women? No thanks. I'll take Kevin Penkin's musical scores instead. Oh my god, this shit was godly, bro. The music without question was top notch. The new OST screams Kevin Penkin, and it actually sets a tone I actually was not expecting at all. Reading this originally, I thought the departure onto the Abyss was a more epic moment in terms of its music, but this adaptation makes it sound a bit more mystical and almost uplifting. It really accentuates the idea of possibility, which I believe suits the series better. The animation was brilliant with Kinema Citrus behind the wheel. Shield Hero Season 2 was clearly the sacrifice for this, and I think it was a worthy one at that. Sorry Shield Hero fans. The pacing this episode was also quite brilliant. I like that we're immediately thrown back into the world and I'm really happy that they actually showcase the sea of corpses. The end credits in the film had me worried that viewers wouldn't get to fully experience the team's last dive, but the anime decided to wind the clock back a few ticks and give us that glorious descent. Also, we margaritas got the sacred lolly struggling to poop sound effect sequence and I gotta say, it sounded way more violent in the anime. <laughs> Yeah, Akihito's comedy is unique, to say the least. I'm honestly super happy with this adaptation, but there was one thing I do think the manga simply did better. I think the intensity of the initial interaction between this dookie face and the paranoid dying old man was a lot less thought-provoking in the anime compared to the manga. The art in the manga was just more terrifying and detailed, and illustrated the horror that is the Abyss more coherently. His facial reactions alone were enough to emphasize just how horrid the giant murder hole actually is. And the anime kind of just brushes that aside with how stable he seems to look. But that was honestly my only real gripe. I think it was a brilliant adaptation for first episode. You know, it tells the story in a way that's captivating for anime-only fans. And it makes it a fresher experience for us manga readers. And that's basically all I have to say about that. Hey, thanks for watching this review. I'll be sure to do one each week whenever I possibly can. I have a full-time job so hours aren't exactly flexible, but I'll do what I can to keep this series weekly. If you're still craving some more Main Abyss and don't want to wait for the anime, feel free to check out my manga animated playlist to watch this entire arc in its manga form with animated panels, voice lines, and custom music. I'd advise starting at chapter 39. That's all from me, my fellow Delvers. I shall see you all even deeper in the Abyss.